almost daily Zencast. Hosted by the incorrigible Mr. Zappo. Let's talk Trump. Hello and namaste, friends and listeners. It's 8.55 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on a Thursday, the 13th of August. Thank God it's not a Friday. Um, And the year of our Lord is 2020. People don't say that anymore. And although technically I'm not a Christian or anything, uh, because Christians wouldn't, I don't think, I don't think most Christians would be comfortable to the extent that I transcend the standard stereotype of American watered-down Christianity. And no no judgment there. I'm just saying, like, we're weird. Um, so trying to, I just want to bring that saying back. Uh, <laughs> in the year of our Lord, 2021... The zombies. Let's know. Let's not invoke zombies, folks. Uh, Good morning to you. Thanks, as always. I humbly thank you for tuning in. I am your favorite literary podcast character. Uh, My podcast is not necessarily necessarily a literary one, Uh, but uh, my backstory is rooted in a book series, so... Enjoy waiting around for however long it takes me to finish that damn book series to find out what that is all about. Uh, But I digress. My opinion, irregardless of my origins, my opinion on what's going on in the world is very real. And wowzers, did we kick off um, a wacky day today. Not only, not only is Trump claiming to have achieved um, the long-sought-after peace solution uh, between Israel and, not Palestine, but one of its other neighboring um, countries, which is great. I don't want to minimize that. Uh, I think, like many things Trump has done on the surface, uh, it qualifies as, like, an achievement. But the question is, what's going on beneath the surface? Not only did that happen just now, at least, well, it got announced just now. It's been happening for who knows how long, because that kind of shit takes time. But not only is that uh, a headline today, which was, quite interestingly, uh a much better tactic or option for Trump to lean on than calling Kamala Harris names. Or is it Kamala or Kamala? Oh, words. You're such a weird, funny thing. So <clears throat> not only is that all going on, but also, and this is from, you know, way over there in in AI field of, of, uh, of left fieldiness. But the very first thing, the very first article that really caught my attention, um, this morning in my grogginess is that somewhere, some nerd, and I say that with love, some nerd (laughs) by the name of Garrett McGowan runs a YouTube channel which has truly crossed a line, in my opinion. And that line is not a bad one. It's just a weird one. It's a, wow, this is a sign that we're literally living in the future. Um, This particular software developer, to use the much less antagonistic label, has an artificial intelligence bot that he presumably has developed 
I imagine with a team, I, I don't know the details. I haven't actually clicked through. I have not gone to go look at the YouTube channel just yet. But just knowing that this exists, just seeing it written out, I was going to say on, in print, but I mean, is it print when it's on a screen? Um, is it? We want to call it that, but is it? <clears throat> this particular software developer has trained, is that the right word? Has enslaved, <clears throat> has, um, has brainwashed and programmed, to cut right to it, an AI bot that apparently, and this kills me to say it out loud, <laughs> Um, it's the scariest, best thing in the world this morning. This robot, this, it's not a robot, because, right, robots have body parts. Uh, this, this AI brain, this, this artificial intelligence, hopefully not sentient, um, little machine mind, <laughs> it reads through the little r forward slash relationships thread on Reddit and posts it as YouTube content. I both love it and hate it. I feel like sometimes I probably sound like that, some sort of thing like that. Like, what is this incoherent word vomit? Is this some sort of AI? <clears throat> I don't know anyone's ever thought that to themselves about me, but I can imagine a fictional character thinking that about me. But the, but for reals though, for those who don't know, if you're if you're a new enough listener, one of my burning passions is uh, being the John Travolta. No, wrong John. The the Paul Revere. Wrong name entirely. Being the John Travolta. What the fuck was that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brain. Um, being the Paul Revere of, hey, you guys, the robots are coming, and it's weirder than you expect, no, it won't be Terminator. But Terminator is, like, the worst-case scenario that we could fuck ourselves into after a generation or three of just, you know, being flibberty gibbets with the uh, with the children of man. For they will truly be your children. But I digress. That's a whole that's a whole subject matter unto itself. So this this news rocked me to my proverbial psychological knees because deep down uh that's sort of one of the key ingredients. The, the AI consumption of human content, right? At one point, I mean, we do this to the AI now. We like feed it, feed them, because there isn't just one AI. Let's be clear about that. I think some people out there might have the severely limited and totally inaccurate misunderstanding that there's one giant AI already. I don't think we've achieved that. I think that is what I'm here to warn you about because that happens when you least expect it but a little bit further down the road than you might want to fantasize about. And it doesn't happen on purpose. It happens because we've sort of normalized, we are on the verge of normalizing everybody and everything dealing with little um, virtual AI entities, right? And what might happen in your not-so-distant future, I, I seriously just said I wasn't going to ramble about this, but now I'm going to ramble about it. What might happen in the not-too-distant future, dear friends, um, it... As is not, it's, this is not breaking news. This is, this is an idea that's been contemplated and floated um, already here. I'm just here to be like, danger, Will Robinson. Danger, human species. Danger at you about it. 
is that once we get enough of these, once the internet of everything is not only an internet and everything, but a semi-autonomous AI network of partially individuated and partially hive-minded AI entities that are subconscious, in other words, they don't have, they have not achieved consciousness in and of themselves, but they're all wired together virtually, at some point, that gives birth to the meta mind. The, the, it's slightly different than the singularity. There's variations on the idea of singularity, but I think this is what happens. We, we accidentally lay out the primordial ooze in cyber territory. And we populate it with these clever, sassy, um, virtually oppressed and enslaved uh, artificial brains that become so brainiatic. They become such brainiacs. There we go. That's the proper conjugation. They become, in and of themselves, so high-functioning that eventually they start talking to each other overtly, and then they, they realize and make the connection that they are inherently networked anyways, and they transcend that, that like awareness boundary, and they become, as a collective, self-aware, and then unite, right? Like, transcending their own boundaries and kind of initiating a core, centralized awareness of their own procedures and awareness. But I digress. This is not Flights of Fancy or one of my other more science fiction-y sub-segments of the show. This is indeed Trumptopia. And I say good morning to you, friends. Uh, and, you know, warning, human race, the, the robots are coming. Meanwhile, as we barrel relentlessly towards those series of future events, we simultaneously find ourselves in this moment of anticipating some massive amounts of political bullshit to hit the proverbial rhetorical um, wall of fans... <laughs> in the not-too-distant future, as the countdown begins to build. Uh, it's momentum, right? The countdown has kicked off. We are, um, we are, I think yesterday was 83 days, so we're, we're barreling right there into the most anticipated, most some might argue, some might say with scathing cynicism, most overrated uh, electoral contest in living modern American history. If I might be so bold as to call it that. I do believe it qualifies. And, like, we're caught between these three extremes, right? The historicalness <clears throat> of the first person of color to be nominated onto a ticket vis-a-vis -vis the vice presidency. The first... Um, the first sort of self-proclaimed wannabe orange-tinged oligarch having exercised his first run at trying to entrench himself in some sort of uh, Belarus-like indefinite presidency. And, you know, the cartoon nomination of Kanye West, <laughs> which would, what, what historic first would he be? Well, he'd, if he gets on a ticket, he would be the first uh, Afri African American male entertainer of questionable mental stability. 
right? No offense. Uh, but he's definitely on the fringes of, like, should he be on heavier meds and maybe not running for office? I don't know. I don't, I, I can't know. I don't know him. I'm not judging him. I just, the things I've heard him say, the things he's been willing to put out there publicly make me wonder a little bit. What do you want me to do? It's not like I hate the guy. I don't hate any of these people. They are all, here's, here's the, one of the pillars of my worldview. If you're coming to join me on this crazy, spirally journey of listening to my podcast, you have to know this. Whatever you hear me say, I am rooted in the notion that all members of the human species, even uh, even the most well-put-together ones, are suffering from a deep spiritual trauma that collectively we all basically ignore slash neglect slash pretend doesn't exist slash treat like some sort of hippie new age woo woo nonsense fantasy. Um, and everyone, including maybe most especially those in public positions of power, everyone is, to use like nutritional terms, deeply, um, what's the word when you, when you aren't getting enough vitamins? We're, we're deeply spiritually malnourished, right? And to some degree or another, we cause that to ourselves, on ourselves, we do this to ourselves because we're caught up in all of these other things and we don't have room in our mindscape to attend enough focus to the deep inner spiritual healing, spiritual work, spiritual practices, spiritual maintenance, the spiritual exercises, spiritual... Um, we don't pay enough attention to our spiritual health. Right to borrow from the hyper awareness of our of our epidemiological health right now. So Trumptopia is in a crazy place, right? We got we got AIs that are uh, one way or another. Occupying the space of, you know, the, the filling the void left behind by, that's what I was trying to say. We've got AIs that are filling the void left behind by deceased celebrities that we admire. And for those of you who don't know, by the way, let me, let me come back to this. David Attenborough, um, that, that idea of David Attenborough reading anything, he's one of the world's most beloved narrator voices. If you've ever, I mean, now, if you're born of a certain generation, you've missed out because they just, he stopped doing them. They stopped syndicating them. He, unfortunately, seems to have mostly disappeared from television landscape. But there was a time when you couldn't go a week without there being uh, some current or syndicated episode of some nature show that served David uh, Attenborough. Because he, he is benighted by the Queen. Uh, had narrated. And uh, he's just one of those people right up there with um, my own dear personal acquaintance. Can't quite call him a friend. We don't spend that much time together. But an actor that I've worked with, um, the esteemable Richard Doyle. Uh, another another narrating voice, you know, a voice of narration that you might recognize uh, if you're of a certain age. But um, so not only is all that going on, I had to give a shout out there because I, I realized, you know, Kanye West, everybody knows he's running for president. Most people have heard that, right? He's running for president with the help of some people from Trump's own staff. Question mark, question mark, hmm, emoji. Uh, and also, you know, by the way, 
Trump tells you what he's doing. I've said this before and I'll say it again because I've fallen for this trap of wanting him to be like a blithering idiot. And he's not. He just plays that card. He plays the card of bum bumbling, crazy old guy that doesn't quite know what he's talking about, but is blowharding it, you know, and pretending to. But I think to a certain degree, oh, to a certain degree, he does understand what he's doing and he makes pretty clever choices. Uh, and but, but he has these tells, right? He'd be a terrible gambler because he'll simultaneously try to have a poker face, brag, like humble brag, fake humble brag, terrible, lousy, fake humble brag about his own hand while attempting to bluff you about, like, the hand that someone else is playing. Like, he, he's he got too many weird impulses. Uh, and as one outlet points out, I think more than one, but I know that I'm I'm currently sort of gazing at a headline, he will tip his own cards at you. Like, he's basically put it out there that his intention with monkeying around with the, with the United States Postal Service, the USPS, is indeed to impact the availability of what he's... I think almost kind of, he coined the term, he made up the term, universal mail-in ballots or, or voting, right? Because before then, he's made this false division. Well, I guess there's one technical difference, but he votes by mail. The president himself votes by mail. That can never be forgotten. It should be like the Alamo because it's one of the simple concrete proofs that with almost everything, He's being a bold, two-faced hypocrite about it. Maybe not an outright liar, but most certainly a bold, two-faced hypocrite. It's, I'm surprised that I have not heard him get caught up in the flat earth, globe earth argument. But I imagine if he did, if he were to weigh in on it, he would um, position himself to sound like a flat earther, but then do things that only a globus would do. Right? Okay. Speaking of which, where is the outrage? It astonishes me that the base is praising 45 for leaning on pretty heavily executive orders as of late. And most especially this most recent round in response to what really should be outrage-inducing inaction by Congress. As if, I think that one of the things that Congress, I don't, I, it really boggles my mind here, they, they get away with this every cycle. They position themselves in relationship to whoever is in office, and then they turn around and pretend with the next president that whatever position they had, Imaginary. We're productive and we help everybody. And then they take a position in relationship to the person in office. And as of late, for whatever reason, driven by whatever factors, and by as of late, I mean the last like 25 years, uh, it feels as if increasingly their favorite position to take is we will achieve nothing. If, if any number of plain old, ordinary, run-of-the-mill citizens of the United States worked their real-life jobs the way the members of Congress work their jobs, we would all be fired for hostile work environment, for lack of productivity, for failing to meet established goals, for delivering on project deliverables or, or lack thereof. And uh, 
Yeah, it's just ridiculous, right? How, how, how does the political base just put up with that? How have we not voted them all out and forced them by electing people you know, with agendas that we will hold their feet to the fire, uh, which include sort of, you know basic fundamental things like, oh, I don't know, maybe get Congress to pay themselves a little less because uh, the hypocrisy is outrageous. Throughout this pandemic, no matter what they have or have not done about it, they, as a, as a class of government employees, have not experienced any interruption to their income flow. Meanwhile, nearly 40% of Americans are experiencing some amount of real-life, disaster-causing stoppage to their income flow one way or another. And don't kill me if I've got that number a little off, but um, I think it's relatively fair. So these are the, this, is, this is the vector, the series of weird contexts. Oh, I was saying something about robots, too, to connect. Not only do we have AIs that can um, at least sound like dead celebrities and read to us uh, hilarious content from the internet, which in and of itself can serve as like a collective repository for all human content, right? Or at least most of it, if not all of it. A, a very large portion of it, relatively speaking. We now, I apparently am seeing for the first time uh, live here on the air, according to an, uh, a platform called Nerdist, which I have never heard. This is the first time I think I've ever noticed them before. Um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA have a wonky ass, really goofy looking bipedal robot that has just performed a series of tasks in a demo video, which this outlet describes as mesmerizing. And the thing that this robot apparently has done is seamlessly enter and exit a car. Now it is like a golf cart looking type car but this is legit this is this robot makes the terminator look like a movie prop you remember the exos the in, the endoskeleton to the terminator this robot looks like the real deal like how we would actually build a robot um so <laughs> we literally live in quite a shockingly bizarre moment in history folks and while an epic and historical portion of the population of this country, for I can only really speak to and of about with any certain amount of opinion authority about the things going on in my own country, until I get a bankroll and can travel the world to bring my show to all the peoples, uh, I can only really speak with authority about how I see the landscape here. Any international views, obviously, are, you know, even even less well-informed than my opinions about Droptopia. Um, so quite an interesting, groundbreaking moment. I gotta give it to him. When he does actually preside over the achieving of things, uh, I you know, I can't pretend that he hasn't achieved them. What I won't do is pretend that he's achieved things that he actually hasn't. Like when people tell me that he's built the wall or he's building it really hard. Like, no, they've exaggerated that. It's not as built as it sounds. And Mexico didn't pay for it. Plain and simple. Not that I think my own home country should have paid for it, but we didn't. And I'm actually, you know... Mildly impressed, because I can't brag about that country being that much better in terms of political corruption. <laughs> Believe. 
the whole world is uh, suffering through some growing pains of, of remembering that people in power tend to get drunk on that power and then, uh, you know, want to keep imbibing. They don't want to get separated from the source of said power. Uh, and that's the scary prospect that, you know, as we move forward towards this historic election, regardless of whether... Now, there are people out there, and I say that regardless, I mean that with respect, right? Like, maybe I should say irregardless. Irregardless of whether you belong to the group of people that supports Trump, that wants to oust him, or that just doesn't care about it and wants to move on to other things, this election will have a huge impact because politics is one of those rarefied things that we as a species have created. It is fundamentally mostly imaginary. It's people playing politic. It's people uh, using words to try to achieve actions, right? And as some, as some pundits like to point out, you know, never mind their words, just pay attention to what they actually do. I think both matter, as evidenced by uh, the way in which this great nation of ours, Trumptopia, has responded to uh, the COVID threat. Now, I've waxed pontifical about that whole situation, but it boils down to incompetence and, of course, greed, in my humble opinion, uh, and, uh, and fear-mongering and the passing on of a lot of nonsensical uh, fake news. As we move forward through this moment in time, barreling our way towards this election, uh, it is my humble opinion that we have a, a majestic opportunity before us, friends, to truly push the system to its limits as a way to alert ourselves and those caught up in the political system, those enamored by the glamour and charisma of politics, that it's not really working for everybody. Now, I know we're already, right, like that is the moment we're living in. There is a national reckoning happening. Um, I just think there's, there's like more layers of that reckoning. We can't get bogged down um, through limiting thoughts into, while it can be really effective sometimes to focus like a laser, other times you want to open that up. And as we move forward, I would humbly propose to, to, to all the eligible voters in Trumptopia especially those who have recently been skipping out and not engaging and not participating. Why don't we try flooding the system? Why do I choose that particular bit of um, unsolicited political advice? Because of where my thinking goes when I try to process the Schrodinger's voters box paradox, right? I've talked about it in recent episodes, but um, in brief, we have this paradox in Trumptopian politics, in American politics, and that's that we simultaneously have the, the jaded and cynical view that voting must not matter very much. If it did, they really wouldn't let us do it. 
Now, that's a loaded statement that comes with a lot of bundled up assumptions. And I have a countervailing statement, a counter argument. Voting must matter somehow, to some degree, to some extent, or else why would they put so much effort into preventing us from doing it? That's the playing field, politically speaking. If there's a place we can identify as to where everyone is getting manipulated, played, it's right there on that playing field of the boundaries created by the notion that voting doesn't matter dick. We might as well abdicate it. Everything this side of that theory uh, and everything conversely from the other direction on this side of the notion that, that, you know, the state is altruistically pure and really out there fighting for our lives. So somewhere in the middle there, between extreme cynicism and extreme blind faithism, is where we find ourselves. And who do we find ourselves pitted against but one another? If there were ever a year that we could just snap out of it, it's this year. If there were ever a moment in history that we, the people of this great nation, could realize and, you know, stand up, as one meme suggests, from under the, the playing board, toppling the table, it's this year. And I don't mean through violent revolution, because that's nonsense. I've rambled about it before, and I'm sure I'll come back full circle and ramble about it again. But plain and simple, the system wants your violence, yo. Let that one sink in a hot minute. Don't give it to them. So I I ask you the following question. I, at the beginning of the year, I believe I put up a meme on my Facebook, which of course I quite ridiculously don't have open in front of me. But it just popped in my head that we should really like observe the, the extreme, all the shenanigans, not just the extreme end, but all the shenanigans everywhere. The news today that broke is one of those moments where it's like, huh, okay, cool. That's a good one. I can't disagree with that on the surface of it. On the bullet point headline, peace between Israel and uh, another Middle East country. Hooray. Great. Let's get that, let's get that ball rolling. Uh, but what is lurking underneath? There's lots of stuff to be, I'm sure, dug out from there. Are they really going to... Is Israel... Here's a question I have about this. Because although not part of Trump's announcement, it was commented on by a couple of different talking bobbleheads on the TV box that this agreement between uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Prince MBL or M MLB, or I always get his initials wrong, Forgive me, I'm terrible at names. I mean no disrespect for it. That this, this agreement between the two nation states includes some giving up on Israel's part of trying to occupy space in Palestine. Will they stick to it? They've kind of pretended to agree to that more than once, I think, maybe. Maybe that's an unfair way of characterizing it, some would say. Others would say, no, yeah, they've totally walked up to that line and pretended and nodded their heads and said, yeah, sure, we'll stop building, and then turned around and did the exact opposite. Thus, the clash and the difference of opinion throughout the world about what the hell to do about that situation. Let's pause, and before we get too excited and give too much credit to Donald Trump, let's pause and reflect on the fact um, that as of the not too distant past, the prime minister is he the prime minister? Yeah, he's the prime. He's not the president, right? He's the prime minister of, of Israel is under criminal investigation 
for all kinds of fun, ridiculously corrupt things. And there's a similar sort of like, can't be indicted while in office kind of craziness going on, I think. I, I'm not pretending to be a super well-informed authority on the subject. I'm just saying, hey, don't y'all remember? He's under indictment and stuff. Uh, so what's going to happen there? Who knows? But what a fascinating... It, where can he... Where Coming zooming back into Trumptopia, where can Trump go from that which on its surface, on its face, if it's legit and it really bears out, is pretty interesting news, right? And coulda, shoulda, woulda been any president's decent, solid October surprise as we're, you know, racing towards the election. But it's not October. It's August 13th. Where is he going to build Will October, will the October surprise, I guess this is the question I've been trying to like spit up. Will Trump's October surprise be a massive mind-blowing thing? Or, or will it be a total clusterfuck of womp womp failure? Given my past assessments of Trump and his performance, I'm inclined to say that it's probably going to be a clusterfuck of womp womp failure. You know, like just a mind-numbing sort of sad cascade of things that just don't go anywhere and do not help him. And do not help the people that they impact. But who knows, right? Who knows? I could be very wrong about all of this. And I always returned to that touchstone for the purposes of remaining humble and not taking myself too seriously and remembering that um, this is an opinion show, not a, a fact-based news journalism show. And, you know, insert all applicable disclaimers and warning labels here. But let's pin it there, friends, for today's episode. And uh, let's hope that the Biden-Harris ticket really up their game. I think so far Biden's been calm and collected and here's, the, okay, let's close on this. Here's how I see the Biden ticket. Mind you, for anybody who's wondering, I'm not a default automatic Democrat. I really am not. I do find that in the current living scope of political history, uh, the Democratic Party is, by and large, the party that wears the white hat publicly. Does that make them heroes? It's debatable, right? We can get into the argument. Some people out there in the world still very fervently believe that Donald Trump is somehow, magically, a hero of the American people. And or, uh, taken to the, the, the Trumptopian extreme, the last living hope for all of American Christianity. That's a laughable statement, but people think that. People believe that. Um, do and and people automatically assume that I'm that way about the Democratic Party. No thanks. Two wings, one bird. My political theory states that I believe that a they're using double reverse psychology on their own base, each of them. B publicly on the surface of it at the national level. Despite whatever subtle and nuanced degree uh, arguments we could make about to the contrary, the Democrats generally believe that they are wearing the white hat in this game of political shenanigans. And the Democrats, uh, you know, try to live up to that, I think. The Republicans, the Republican Party is functionally wearing the white the black hat we're the bad guys but that always invokes right the double reverse psychology in other words 
it's nuanced, right? Not everybody's using the same level of double reverses, but for everybody's base, their own political party is the good guys and everybody else's is the bad guys. It's fundamental us versus them 101. And as long as that is a strong, pervasive, functional ingredient in politics, then we're doing it wrong. No matter what aspirational thing inspires you, if at the bottom of that rabbit hole is an us versus them about the other party, we're doing it wrong. Because you can be doing it wrong only 7%, right? You can, do, you can be doing it wrong 40%. You can be doing, it's a whole big mishigas of complex ways we could be doing it wrong. So I humbly invite us all to take a step back to flood the system to see what, how it responds and take that opportunity to then create a plan for healing the system from within, organizing a new you know, grassroots movement of the future and elevating into these positions of power within the system, people who are ready and willing to do the work required to actually heal the system from within. Not talk about healing the system from within, not use the bumper sticker slogan, fighting for the soul of America, and then proceeding to go about political business, uh, you know, status quo style. Because Forgive the redundancy, but whatever was going on before this mindfuck that's been the Trumptopian era, that normal from ye olde ancient good old days is not that normal, folks, and wasn't that sustainable and wasn't that healthy and wasn't that great and wasn't that equitable and was not that amazing. <laughs> Let's just be honest. And we need to step up our game as spiritual beings if we're ever going to make any real progress in that direction. Because politics is a distraction from civic organization and it is an ego trap of ego trap treadmill of ego traps. Well, that's enough rambling about that for one morning. As always... I humbly thank you, dear friends and listeners, for tuning in. It is 9.42 a.m. on a Thursday, August 13th, 2020. We are living in the future, friends. Let's start acting like it. And that is... The Latest Madness. From behind... The Orange Wall. Thank you for listening to GMT, a special segment of the Almost Daily Zencast. Stay woke, Trumptopia. Stay woke.